Normal count of red blood cells at birth is around 6 to 7 millions per cubic millimeter while in adult males it is 5 to 5.5 millions per cubic millimeter and adult females it is still lesser that is 4.5 to 5 millions per cubic millimeter. So you see why the uh, count in adult males is more compared to the females because of the reproductive hormone testosterone which actually stimulates the erythropoiesis and it also causes um, release of erythropoietin so that also increases the erythropoiesis on the other hand uh, female hormone that is estrogen it inhibits erythropoiesis that is why the rbc count is less in females compared to males but you see at birth the count is much more so at birth and uh, in infants the rbc count is much more compared to that in adults why is it so well infants have a hemoglobin that is hemoglobin f and this hemoglobin f has much higher affinity for oxygen so this hemoglobin have by virtue of having higher affinity for oxygen there is a decrease in release of oxygen to the tissues so you may ask that why then hemoglobin f is present in uterus and after at birth well, this hemoglobin F increased affinity is useful for carrying oxygen from the maternal blood to the fetal blood. So that is why that is important. But because of this virtue only, it is releasing less oxygen into the tissues. So that means this compensation is brought about by increased RBCs because uh, there will be hypoxia to the tissues, right? So it will lead to increase in synthesis of the RBCs. So you should remember that at birth, RBC count is much more compared to that in adults. Then lifespan. In adults, the RBC lifespan is 100 to 120 days, basically approximately 4 months. While in infants, the lifespan of RBC is approximately 60 to 80 days. So that is approximately 2 to 2 and a half months. And uh, this is because that in infants, the RBCs are susceptible to oxidative damage. Coming to shape and size of RBCs, you see the diameter of RBC. So this diagram is showing the RBC and uh, if you see the full axis, right? So this is the diameter. Diameter of RBC is approximately 7.5 microns. Central thickness is 1 microns while peripheral thickness is 2 microns. So centrally you see thickness is less it is only 1 microns while peripherally it is more this is 2 microns. And this is the biconcave shape of the RBCs which we talk about. Then volume of a single RBC is 90 micrometer cube. So fundamentally in cross section of a RBC we are seeing the biconcave shape of RBC. And what are the advantages of this biconcave shape? What is the need and how it is helping the physiology? First of all, if surrounded by a hypotonic solution where the water will start moving from the hypotonic solution into the cell, in that case, RBC can swell quite a bit before bursting. And basically this concept is used in one test known as osmotic fragility where RBCs are placed in different solutions with different hypotonicity and we see that in which solution the RBCs have started bursting more. So that uh, gives the osmotic fragility of the cells. And as the RBCs age, there is increase in the osmotic fragility with age of the RBCs because of the loss of this membrane of the RBCs and there is change in the shape. So this biconcave shape is best suited for squeezing through the narrow spaces and you see the size of the capillaries is around 5 to 6 micrometers while the diameter of RBCs is 7.5 micrometers. So how do they pass through the capillaries? That is because of this biconcave shape. Then due to this biconcave shape they have a large surface area to volume ratio. So for a particular volume, the surface area of the RBC is quite large and due to this, there is increase in the efficiency of O2 transfer. So more membrane is available for the diffusion of the oxygen across the RBC membrane. Now, 
RBCs do not have any nucleus or any cell organ as such. There is no mitochondria, no ribosome, no endoplasmic etc. Why is it important? First of all, uh, they are the mature cells and they are not going to divide. So there is no need of nucleus. But other cell organelles are not also present. So since mitochondria is not there, the source of energy for RBC, it is mainly going to be anaerobic metabolism. So that is important since mitochondria is not there. But why is it so that there are no cell organelles? How does it help RBC? Well, RBC is basically carrying hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a very big protein, okay. And RBC is basically carrying this hemoglobin. So basically RBC is a bag of hemoglobin. So if this RBC is filled with other cell organelles then there would be very less space for carrying of the hemoglobin. So that's how by getting rid of all the organelles RBC is most efficient in carrying the hemoglobin. And remember that uh, hemoglobin cannot increase more the percentage, the volume, the amount of volume which is occupying in the RBC, it cannot increase more. And on the other hand, if hemoglobin formation is impaired, then the size of the cell also decreases. Uh, that's why we get uh, in iron deficiency where hemoglobin synthesis is impaired, it is decreased. The size of the cell also decreases because there is no need why the size, cell size should be more. So that uh, leads to microcytic hypochromic anemia. So basically RBCs are fully saturated with hemoglobin and when we say fully saturated that means 34% of the volume of the RBC is occupied by hemoglobin and that is uh, basically this value is represented as MCHC mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. So 34% of the volume of RBC is occupied by hemoglobin. And if we say weight wise, actually hemoglobin is responsible for 90% of the dry weight of the RBC. Now let's move on to little bit more intricacies on structure of mature red cell. Now what is any membrane made up of? It is made up of lipids, proteins and carbohydrates and this kind of diagram you might have seen anywhere. Right, so there is uh, this lipid membrane is there and there are a lot of proteins are there, right. So this is a integral uh, protein which is basically traversing the membrane, integral protein is there. On the other hand, these are like peripheral proteins, they are not uh, passing through the entire membrane like this integral membrane protein. Integral membrane protein also known as transmembrane protein. These are just peripheral proteins present on one leaflet of the membrane. So basically like any other uh, membrane, RBC membrane also consists of lipid bilayer, there is carbohydrate and there are membrane proteins and you see proteins are much more than the lipid and uh, it is true for most of the membranes of the various cells, right. So membrane proteins it is 52% and in this the important ones which we should know is that there are integral membrane proteins or transmembrane proteins which include band 3 protein glycophorin, aquaporin, right? Then there are outer peripheral proteins that is lecithin and sphingomyelin and there is inner peripheral proteins including spectrin, enchirin, actin, protein 4.1. Let's see these in a little bit diagrammatic manner so you can understand little bit. Here you see that uh, this is the inner part, okay? Cytoplasmic part and this is the outer part and these are the membrane and you see this glycophorins these are the transmembrane proteins these are transmembrane proteins and here they are also having carbohydrate moieties attached to them then inner peripheral proteins you see what are the inner peripheral proteins here there is band 4.1 protein and uh, here there is band 4.2 proteins there is enchirin and these proteins are attached intracellularly to cytoskeletal elements. And what are these cytoskeletal elements? You see, tropomycin is there, there is actin. So this, you might have heard the name actin in the skeletal muscle contraction, right? Tropomycin is not the cytoskeletal protein, sorry, it is actin. And these are the actin filaments, right? So they are kind of holding the cell membrane and attaching them to the inner 
contents and that is mostly the hemoglobin. So these proteins are very important in maintaining the shape of RBCs. Suppose there is problem in these proteins, enchirin or 4.2, 4.1 band protein, then the actin will not be able to attach to the membrane of the RBC and there will be change in the shape of the RBC. And that happens in a disease known as hereditary spherocytosis. So in this, defects in the genes that code for certain proteins like spectrin, Enchirin, so enchirin is the most common, then band 3 protein, protein 4.2 and other erythrocyte membrane proteins also. That will lead to change in the shape of the RBCs and it will change from biconcave to spherical. So our RBCs which were like this, they will become like this. So what will be the problem? See, we told you the advantages of biconcave shape. So once the RBCs become spherical, those advantages will be lost. They will have very much difficulty in traversing through the capillaries and especially in spleen. Actually, spleen is the graveyard of RBC. So the cells which have aged and become less deformable, they cannot pass through the splenic sinusoids. Now, with the change in shape of the RBCs to spherical, there will be too much destruction of RBCs, especially in a spleen. And uh, what is this basically? Too much destruction of RBCs is known as, uh, destruction of RBCs basically is known as uh, hemolysis. And uh, too much destruction will lead to hemolytic anemia. Okay. And uh, because of hemolysis, there will be excess production of uh, bilirubin due to the metabolism of the hemoglobin. And ultimately, it will lead to jaundice. Spleen also increases in size. So this is the classical triad of hereditary spherocytosis. That is hemolytic anemia, right? Jaundice and splenomegaly. So for the treatment of hereditary spherocytosis, because too much hemolysis is taking place, blood transfusion may be required. And um, depending on the size of the spleen and how much hemolysis is uh, being going on. Suppose in moderate to severe cases, splenomegaly is also done to prevent excessive hemolysis. Now let's talk about the functions of RBCs. So RBC functions are basically same as that of the function of hemoglobin. So RBC actually transports hemoglobin, which in turn transports oxygen and carbon dioxide. And since hemoglobin is a uh, Protein, so like most proteins, it acts as a buffer also. So these are the uh, basically functions of the hemoglobin. And since hemoglobin is enclosed in RBCs, these are the functions of the RBCs. Then RBCs also transport nitric oxide in blood. So that is a novel function which you should remember. But you see we are telling that mainly the function of RBC is to carry hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is a protein. So my question is that why hemoglobin is not directly present in circulation, then also it can do its job, isn't it? What is the need that hemoglobin should be carried in RBC? Well, if hemoglobin is present only in blood, then it is such a large protein that there will be increase in blood viscosity and osmotic pressure. So, it is going to increase the resistance to the flow and there will be too much increase in the blood pressure. So it is better to be carried within a cell. Second, it also prevents leakage through the capillary membrane into the tissue spaces or through the glomerular membrane of the kidney each time the blood passes through the capillaries. So this hemoglobin can actually filter in the kidney and it happens when excessive hemolysis occurs and hemoglobin is present in the circulation. There is a protein known as hemopexin. Okay, so this hemoglobin binds with hemopexin. So this prevents the leakage of hemoglobin into the circulation. But when there is too much hemoglobin, then this hemopexin gets used up, right? Then this hemoglobin is free in the circulation. In that case, it starts appearing in the tubules.